Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off the Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We'll unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. And remember, if you find yourself sitting on a comma in your life, you can also talk to me without a microphone. To explore coaching with me and getting off the comma in your own life, check out my information and book a call with me at offthecomma.com. And I'm also doing something different. I'm curating my own sponsor community, local businesses and professionals who I handpick and who align with our vision here. Be sure to check them out, learn more about them on my website and my YouTube channel. In the meantime, let's get into this week's conversation conversation. And welcome back to another uh, year two episode of Off the Comma. And we've got another great episode with another exciting guest. And um, this week's guest is really important to me because um, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but um, this is uh, gonna, this is one of my coaches, actually. Flame um, has worked with me. I've worked with Flame for uh, a number of months. And so uh, we've kind of gotten to know each other. <laughs> She's certainly gotten to know me. Uh, and now I get an opportunity for the tables to turn a little bit and in a in a very specific way and learn a little bit more about Flame. So I'm going to stop rambling. Flame, thank you for being here with us. I'm going to turn it over to you. This is Flame Shoulder. Flame, what would you like us to know about you? How would you like to be known? Well, Paul, I'd love to be known as someone who is wise and authentic. Mm. I think that's been a hallmark of my coaching. I've been a coach now for 20 years, which wow. seems completely impossible that that number could be that high. But I also have two teenagers and I live in the middle of the United States. So uh, it's an interesting place to be politically right now. Mm. Um, and I have my own podcast. Mm. So I'm part coach, part podcaster. And I'm really happy to be here with you today. Nice, nice. That's right. Yeah, and we'll have to we'll have to make sure that you um, give us some info. Well, go ahead and do it now. Tell us the name of your podcast. We'll send some people your way. Yeah. So my good friend Jeannie Ivy and I have a podcast that we call the Spark Sisters, and it's about living an authentic life. So you can go to SparkSisters.com and see all the episodes we've done. We've been on a bit of a hiatus, but hopefully we'll get it back going maybe later this year. Nice. Well, and that's the beauty of podcasts, right? Is the episodes are there. The work you've done is there. The interviews you've had is there. So even when you take a break or even if, if we go a period without having episodes, like all that stuff stays there for people to be able to enjoy. And I think it's part of living an authentic life, right? For that sure. We aren't always able to focus on the things we would love to focus on. And I'm I'm thinking about my topic already, but yeah, that is being... <laughs> on the comma. <laughs> oh, for sure. How many times was that the topic of conversation on our coaching call? <laughs> oh my gosh, right? <laughs> well, let's um, get into your story. As with all episodes, you know, you and I haven't talked about what you're going to be sharing today. So I'm very excited to learn a little bit more about your story and your experience. And and um, we'll get into the five questions here in a moment. But before we do, I like to do something that you're very familiar with and that I do for every guest in, episode, in every episode. Before we get started, as you think about the conversation ahead in the next 45 minutes or so, what intention would you have for yourself? I want to be able to share a time in my life that was really hard and in that sense process it mm -hmm. even a little bit more and hopefully be able to help somebody who's listening. Yeah. And I, I hear that intention and uh, my intention is to support you in that by obviously creating the space where you can share that story openly. And it sounds like the opportunity to do a little bit of work with it too, as you said, processing. And exactly as you said, that someone or many someones out there will hear your story and see a little bit of themselves in that story, feel a little bit less alone, a little bit more connected. And in the best of cases, uh, inspired and empowered to maybe go out and do something that they've been wanting to do. 
All right. Well, Flame, let's jump into the questions and let's start with the first question. Where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? The comma that I'm thinking about is when I was a young mother. Mm -hmm. And my children were both at home. They're 27 months apart. So they were both pretty little at the same time. And I wanted to go be a businesswoman. I wanted to be being creative. I wanted to be doing everything but staying at home. And that was right after the recession of 2007, mm. 2008, whenever that was. So money was tight. And that put me in a particular position where I felt really stuck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you've got this one role, this one kind of universal job with two employees, so to speak, that you're responsible <laughs> for. Um, and, and yet there's a calling to do something different, more, and that's to own your own business. And interesting that it's also happening at the same time that the economic climate isn't really helpful to people who are wanting to start their own businesses. So you said you were feeling stuck. What else would you say about the circumstances of that situation? A kind of tension for me between wanting to be a great mother and almost every other intention I had. <laughs> and I didn't anticipate that. I wanted children. I was really happy that they were there. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't figure out how to have any balance, how to maintain friendships, how to um, have downtime, how to take care of myself. And then it was all so new, I, I guess. And that kind of tension did not put me in a very good mindset. Well, so <laughs> I hear that. And it sounds like you were trying to jug juggle a number of things. Was this, I guess maybe the question I have is, is this in the starting, setting up, and forming your business? Or is this kind of after you've gotten your business underway and now this has become the situation? It was in the first three years of my business, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was in a place where I was in connection with a lot of coaches. Um, it seemed like opportunity was possible, but I had neither the time, the money, the physical energy to do anything about it. I couldn't afford a babysitter. I couldn't um, I couldn't put my kids in daycare because there was no guarantee that I would make money from the time I spent away from them. And I didn't have that at my disposal. So I ended up feeling really lonely, really unsupported, very resentful, grumpy. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, I got to a place where I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. It sounds, it, it sounds a little bit kind of like a, a a form of isolation as well. Yeah. To add to that, Paul, we moved from Colorado to Nebraska on my son's first birthday. Mm. Uh, and his sister is older than he is. So, you know, I had both kids and then we just moved to Nebraska. We'd never been here. We really didn't know anybody, but the cost of living in Denver, Colorado, even back then was so high mm -hmm. for a young family trying to make it and then add the economic distress on top of it. We just decided we needed a different choice and we moved to Omaha and it's been a great choice, by the way, but um, it added to the isolation. Now I really genuinely didn't know anybody. This this business that you started, was this your coaching business that you were referring to earlier? Yeah. And I ended up having a lot of odd jobs, you know, while I was trying to get my coaching business up and going, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's all this difficulty that you've been describing and these challenges, right? So I guess, let me go ahead and move to the second question. You, you've answered it a little bit, and then we can kind of go back and forth between the questions. You know, at this point, given what you've shared about this comma you were sitting on, what did it create for you in addition to what you've also shared? It created a longing for connection and community because at the same time, I was, you know, sort of fresh out of coach training, right? And so I'm, the people I am talking to on the phone are my coach 
buddies and they're helping me connect with my intentions and connect with what's important to me. And I'm getting clearer and clearer about, oh my gosh, I'm a shy person by nature, but I need people. I love people. I miss people. So that longing for community was definitely created in that time. And there was a kind of container I can see now looking back that was created of the kind of family I wanted to have. Mm. And it was not clear to me exactly how to do that, but I can see that if I had been busy, if I'd been the kind of mom who worked full time, that would have been a different container. But I was basically the container at that point. And so there was also a kind of pressure yeah, to be be healthy, be happy, be taking care of things. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, I know we're at the beginning of your story. Yeah. And and just kind of go into a devil's advocate role. It's like, okay, well, you described starting this business and you've now kind of really laid out all these different challenges and struggles and, and these different things that it created for you, which were kind of difficult. I mean... A question I could ask is, what kept you moving forward with it? What 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 kept you pursuing this particular objective? Two major things. The love of my children and my desire to be a coach. Mm-hmm. That was, once I figured out what coaching was, that was the only thing I wanted to do. Mm. That's probably still true. I'd I'd rather do that than anything else on any given day. Um, And I feel very grateful to know that about myself at this point. Mm -hmm. I I think about that a lot, Paul. What was it? How did I get through that? What was it inside of me that made that possible? And I guess it was a kind of inner perseverance that human beings possess. Uh, It's a a testament to the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, and and even... Let's kind of go back a little bit, actually, because, you know, we could be talking to any person about any type of business, right? And 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 facing different kinds of challenges, maybe even some of the same challenges and struggles. But you said, I would rather do that than pretty much anything else. Your, your love of coaching. What was the thing or the things that you were really eager or excited or hopeful to gain from pursuing this business? I wanted to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. I think I always have. My parents would tell you when I was a little kid, I was going to save the planet ecologically. (laughs) I've always sort of had a make it better than you found it impulse. And although I wouldn't say that's my mission as a coach exactly anymore, that same general vibe is there. Mm -hmm. I just want people to be happy. I want to alleviate suffering. Mm. Why? Why why is that an important mission for you? I think because I suffered a lot. Mm -hmm. As As a small child, I was born with a couple of, they're not really birth defects, but I don't hear very well. I don't see very well. Um, I was born very early, so, you know, immune system stuff. And I'm sure you know people like this. None of that's visible. So I look normal. So you get treated like a normal. I mean, I'm putting big air quotes around that word. but So you get treated one way, but you're really not capable of Mm -hmm. doing what other people do. And I think that also bred my persistence and my resilience because I – just had to do that every day to get from the beginning to the end of the day. But also, um, it made me very compassionate that lots of people have their version of this. And they're not always physical ailments. They could be psychological. They could be spiritual. They could be on every level. And I believe that if we can alleviate some of the suffering, we give people the capacity to do the healing, and it becomes this incredible upward spiral where we start making the world a better place together, you know, and it just gains momentum. And I see that in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, the world is a happier, healthier place than it's ever been. But, you know, we as human beings, we still suffer. So I'd love to take that away wherever I can. 
I, I sense, you know, there's this element of empathy, right? You didn't use that word, but I mean, this is essentially everything that you're describing. And what also strikes me is, I don't know why this comes up. I don't know if I should even mention it, but I'm going to, and then let you kind of respond to it. Um, you were, you said earlier, like you have these limitations, right. That are invisible to other people. And so you're seen as one way normal, as you said, in air quotes, but you're not capable of doing the thing that's expected or what have you. And I wonder also if then people's reaction is kind of disproportionate too, because since they don't know what your struggle is or your limitation, then their reaction may not necessarily be one of empathy, but one of frustration, anger, what have you. I mean, expand on that. Does, does it matter? Is it relevant? It is relevant. And, I, and I'll add to that, that I grew up in the Midwest, which is not exactly the warmest emotional place on the planet. Mm. I love my family. I know I'm loved by them, but there was not a lot of, oh, you fell down and skinned your knee. Let me kiss it for you. Mm. My mom, maybe she's pretty good like that, but uh, that was not really the messaging from the rest of the world. It was more like, get up, get going. We can't linger on this. And and if, you know, I didn't think of this until just now, but if you look back at me as a small child, I was just crying and grumpy and agitated all the time. People would call me a brat. Well, I was. I mean, I did have big emotions, but now I can look back with a lot of compassion and say, well, that's because I had real needs that I didn't know how to speak to. And no one could see them. So I couldn't hear. I couldn't really see. I couldn't, you know, I, of course I was confused and frustrated and hard to get along with. <laughs> I didn't I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that is germane. I think it's definitely a part of this story. And wanting to take that away for people. And for me, coaching is the the sustainable way that I've found to be able to contribute that to other people as opposed to volunteering or something that might take more physical vitality because unfortunately physical mm -hmm. vitality is not my strength but i've got a great mind for this stuff so yeah yeah and and, and as you talk about the you know being frustrated and being described as a brat i mean it just really embodies and illustrates so many other possible angles or scenarios to explore that we see every day in our lives. Um, you know, I, each one of us has our own experience. I could self-reference, obviously, things about, you know, especially from a hearing perspective, certain things that I can't hear. And it's like, I, ah, I can't understand you. And yet the other people are getting frustrated with me because I keep saying, what, huh, huh, what, right? And it just becomes this little cycle of reacting without necessarily communicating, understanding, empathizing, sympathizing. That had to, and given the number of things that you've described, right, that had to just really create its own experience for you, right, on a daily basis. Yeah, to your point earlier, it was very alienating. I, I just felt mm. like I didn't fit here. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I don't see other people having a hard time like this. What is that? What's wrong with me? Am I broken? And actually, it was really freeing. Sometime in my 30s, well, probably about the time I was on the comma, I had a breakthrough where I went, I am broken. Mm -hmm. I don't have to fight it. There are things that are legitimately wrong with me. <laughs> and it was a relief mm. to sort of set the bar at a different level, given that I basically have a disability. But no one mm. had ever called it that. My parents would hate that. Mm. Because they think I'm capable of everything. And I am on one level. But I'm not on another level. It's interesting how people will associate words and labels, right? If they use the word 
or the label disabled, then that somehow means you're no longer capable. And you're, you're saying that's quite the opposite. Yeah, I totally don't believe that. And I do believe that people do have limitations and it's okay to honor them, which was an idea that was never floated <laughs> in my young life. And guess what? Newsflash, even the people who consider themselves to be the most able have very <laughs> many limitations <laughs> and are probably more inclined to express frustration, lash out, and be a brat when faced with those limitations. One of the things that has really inspired me about the coaching model specifically that I was trained in was the idea that physical reality is made of limits. So don't fight them. Don't worry about the fact that life has limits. That's normal. That's all. Those are like the rules of the game. The rules of engagement are that you're going to bump up against not enough time, not enough money, not enough physical vitality, not enough of stuff all the time. And it's that's normal. Mm -hmm. And what do we do with that? Yeah. How do we live into that reality? And that's so that time when I was on the comma was sort of brewing all of the, uh, it was like a call to surrender to that reality mm -hmm. instead of thinking I'm an Amazon and I can do anything I want to do. Mm -hmm. Part of that container was coming to terms with, actually, I'm just one person and I can only do what I can do. It, it sounds like, and correct me where I misstate any of this, but it, you've kind of come back around full circle and you've added another, you've gone over the canvas with the brush again and added another layer of color to this, right? So so when you first started talking, it was like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom, I've got two young kids and I want to start my business and the economy is in the toilet, right? And now we're hearing that and whether intentionally or inadvertently in choosing this particular career path, this particular business, this practice, I'm also championing for people who are like me and coming to terms with and developing a new relationship of the thing that it also makes me. Which is then coloring my presence as a mother. Mm -hmm. For the better, mm -hmm. because I'm not expecting the world from my children, who I recognize to be little people with their own limitations. So, yeah, it really does come full circle. And I mean, what what a I, I know this grossly over I, I, I know this grossly oversimplifies the experience for you. But, you know, what a. A powerful, like. I want to use the word gift. I don't know if gift is the right word or not, but what a powerful thing to receive, to be able to just even be in that observer position of a life that includes everything that you've described. I think I would call it a crucible, right? Like the heat was on, mm. the rubber had met the road. My kids were there. They need me. I'm the only mother they have. And I have all these other things. I want to do and that you know creates a kind of friction and heat and it's I guess it kind of goes with my name I didn't think of this until just now one of the things I love about fire is that if you put something in the fire it will burn it down to its fundamental elements right mm -hmm. um, and in a crucible if you put certain kinds of metal there you will get the pure form when the fire goes out. And I feel like that was, Ooh. that was my comment. Oh, wow. That is, I mean, that's profound. That's rich. There's, there's so much you're saying there. Yeah. I mean, it sucked at the time, but I'm very, very grateful for that period of my life now. Mm. Dare I ask, what was the pure metal that was left behind after that particular stage in the crucible? Sure. You can ask that. I believe that my capacity to be with people who suffer was amplified exponentially. And that has created a kind of presence, a willingness to be authentic, a capacity to experiment and play in the face of very limited resources. And I think it made me, you know what it did, Paul? 
it helped me recognize that happiness is largely a choice, mm. that my circumstances were probably never going to be perfect. I am a recovering perfectionist. But if I could still choose to find the joy, the peace, the connection, even if I couldn't go out to dinner or, you know, um, spend all day working on my business, I could still find what was good in life, then I would probably be okay. What were, what were you finding at that stage that was good in life? I had two very cute children. Mm-hmm. So they would smile and laugh and, you know, have picnics in the yard and evoke all those sweet memories from my own childhood. Um, I had the best friends. I mean, I still do. A lot of those people uh, who became a part of my community on the comma have stayed my friends for the last 10, 15 years. We ended up creating a babysitting co-op because many of us did not have money to be paying for babysitting. And one of my darling coach friends said, oh, just start a babysitting co-op. She said it was like like it was no big deal. But um, what I did was get Monopoly money. And we paid each other with Monopoly money to watch our kids. And so it was like this mini economy where we cared. And we got to know each other. We got to know each other's spouses and the kids knew each other. And so uh, we lived all across the city, but we supported each other. That is awesome. I love that. And so creative. And and then the the first question that came up is like, so that's the, 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 the vehicle of commerce, the vehicle of trade. What were you able to trade it in for? Was it just continuing to exchange it for more babysitting time or? Yeah, it was just for more. My idea was that money works best when it's flowing. So mm-hmm. the point was not for you to rack up all the babysitting money and, and, huddle it, you were supposed to spend it. You were supposed to take (laughs) your kids and go visit the other people. And, you know, uh, maybe you needed to go to a doctor's appointment on your own. Maybe you wanted to go grocery shopping all by yourself. Maybe you wanted to do gardening. You know, the point was if the money was flowing, you could do whatever you wanted and have support of people who you knew would really care about your kids Mm -hmm. in the meantime. So that was For someone who had been longing for community but really had never experienced it, that was so sweet for me. Mm. You know what came up for me too was in a. It sounds like you were. um, Oh, how do I want to say this? Like normally, when we have conversations about money, we're talking about saving it, investing it, growing it, and then it becomes. I mean, as you acknowledged, right? It becomes more of a kind of like a collecting sort of scheme. I have other words. I'll reserve them. Um, <laughs> you're you're promoting and facilitating possibility, right? And, and use it, spend it, take advantage of what it can do for you and, and buy yourself, you didn't use the word freedom, but buy yourself time, buy yourself experiences, right? So, yes. And you know what you're making me realize, Paul, is that Part of what I cultivated by being on the comma was discernment. Mm -hmm. Because my resources were so limited, what would be the best use of my money? What would be the best use of my time? What would be the best use of my physical energy or my emotional energy? And, you know, I was in my 20s. Most of us aren't really clear about how to do that then. And so this was a period of time where I got to, okay, this is worth it. This is not. This is kind of worth it. This is definitely not, you know, and just like better one, better two, constant checking. And so, yeah, it did shape my views about money, even though we were using monopoly money in the babysitting co-op. I began to see that sometimes if I spent the money on the babysitting then I would have more energy because of whatever I went and did. Maybe I went out for a date night with my sweetheart or did something creative, a painting, or a, you know, took time to write a poem or something that used that different part of my brain. And those things would bring me energy. Mm. So the money was worth it. I'm not sure I had that awareness before being on the comma. Mm. And yet, 
you were doing it, right? Which kind of emphasizes another point is just because we don't necessarily see something or acknowledge something doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening. Which then kind of, oops, very quickly doubles back to some of what you were sharing earlier with the way other people perceived the limitations that you carried with you every day. Just because they didn't see it, just because they weren't aware of it, didn't mean it wasn't there. Blame, let me move into question three. And then again, we can just kind of bounce back and forth as as you choose to. As you look back at this comma that you shared with us, and even kind of more context beyond it, but the the comma itself, what did you learn about yourself or what are you? What did you learn about yourself? I learned that I'm much stronger than I thought. I learned that having strong intentions in your life is a bit of a double-edged sword. But when you do what you need to do to live out your intentions, that is where the greatest satisfaction is. Because I could have buckled. I could Mm. have gone and gotten a job and given up on coaching. I'm glad I didn't. I could have been one of those moms, and I know that these women and men are out there everywhere right now, who literally, I did the math, I would have brought home about $47 a month after daycare. Mm. I could have been one of those moms who worked full time and didn't really get anything out of it and missed out on raising my kids. Glad I didn't do that. Mm. So I guess it also made me into someone who feels like it's worthwhile to stay strong in your convictions, even when it's hard. I hear that. And I want to acknowledge something. I'm going to kind of insert myself in this a little bit too. It's like, you made a statement that we all make, and we hear this all the time. I make this, I hear people talk about it. And you said, I could have gone and gotten a job. I I think it's important to just kind of clarify. (laughs) You had a job, you had several jobs, right? So Correct me if I know I'm putting the words in your mouth, but it's not that you could have gone and gotten a job. You could have gotten a conventional job being employed by someone else. I could have decided to exchange my work time mm-hmm. for money. Somebody else's money. Yeah. 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 Somebody else's I, 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 the reason I feel so like compelled to call that out is that too often solopreneurs, gig workers, people who are self-employed get dismissed. And whenever things are tough, they're told to go get a job. And and then it's so easy for us to buy into the, oh yeah, I don't have a job. And then there's, there's all this flood of beliefs and things like that that come with it. And it's like, I think it's just really important to kind of acknowledge for everyone. You do have a job. It's that's not <laughs> really the thing you're work. going to get. Yeah. It's that's not really the thing. It's a different thing we're describing here. So <laughs> yeah, I was certainly occupied. And I love that you call that out, Paul. You're absolutely right. And because we're both coaches, I'm sure we've both heard people say, Oh, I'm gonna have to go get a job. And it's like a dirty word. Mm-hmm. Later, after my kids went to school, both full-time, first of all, I came home that day and cried real tears of joy. I was so Mm. happy I had made it to the end of my (laughs) comma. But um, once that was done, I went and got a part-time gig that I could do during the day that would bring in some immediate cash. You know, I'm a big believer that you need to do what you need to do to take care of Mm -hmm. things. But within maybe two years of that, then things started to take off from my coaching business because of the community I had built Mm -hmm. while I was on the comma. Mm -hmm. So it all tied together, I guess. Yeah. Well, and you talked earlier about conviction, right? And, And basically staying strong. And sometimes that is just about being able to continue moving forward when you're in a place of uncertainty or a place where things aren't clear or things do continue to feel uh, stuck. And yet look at the payoff. Not that you would have necessarily predicted that or banked on that, but you just never know what I'm hearing in your experience is that you just never know what opportunities might be growing or germinating or even cooking for you when you didn't even realize or intend to be in the kitchen. Absolutely. Are your circumstances right now making you into the kind of person you need to be in order to live a happy life? Mm. And how can we surrender to that? Mm-hmm. 
that's been one of the greatest questions of my life, you know, whether that's the problems that I was given at birth or the comma I was on when my children were little, you know, lot, I can look at de- several different points along the way where I go, oh man, that that's almost like that was on purpose. That has, that's made me who I am. And I love that about me. It's powerful. And it's consistent with what you were saying earlier too, right? About the, you know, when you started your coaching practice, it was kind of based on all the things that you'd experienced and all those things that you had experienced had prepared you to become an effective and, and strong coach. Yeah. Wow. Flame, fourth question, what has changed for you as a result of sitting on this comma? I'm more patient, more discerning. I forged my own path as a mother. I'm a very different kind of mother than my own mom, which was a big deal for me to sort of strike out on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a much stronger community that I truly love. Which of those do you feel like has had the biggest impact on you? I guess I'd have to say my community. I'm a big believer that we don't live in a society haphazardly or accidentally. We live in societies on purpose. We need people to become the best versions of ourselves and to reflect the meaning of life. And I'm so blessed because my friends, I literally have the best friends on the planet, and they teach me so much about myself. And we keep it going back and forth, you know. They're incredibly supportive and kind and funny and so smart. My gosh. So that's like the gift that keeps on giving. I don't often ask questions like this, but just something in what you said. What which you describe your community as being the best friends on the planet. What about your community do you feel like is a mirror of you? All of it. I think before I had a community, Paul, I thought that being vulnerable was a symptom of being weak. And as I have cultivated real friendships where I can be more transparent and ultimately be vulnerable, Mm -hmm. and likewise, they can be vulnerable with me, that has given me an opening into life, the richness of life, the the incredible coincidences in life. I can't tell you the number of times. In fact, I just had a moment like this this week where I went through something and then I get home that night and have a text from a friend and it's like the parallel situation. And then next week I have lunch with a friend and it's the parallel situation. And we just start to laugh. Like, are we making this up? How could we make this up? This is, are we in some kind of matrix? Because how are we all experiencing the parallel versions of the same thing Mm. at the same time? And the result of that is that I feel so affirmed and it's just validates like, this is how life is. These are the things human beings go through and we're doing it together and it's okay. And it's not meant to be perfect or easy or exactly the way we want it to from our egoic minds. It's it's meant to be kind of a roller coaster. Well, and it also seems like there's, you tell me, but it seems like there's a, a, an element of counterbalance in there from the stages in your life where you did feel alone. In fact, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here, you know, what you were describing when you were sitting on the comma and, you know, we explored the the concept of isolation and how that fit. And you said how I felt alone and, and even growing up with these limitations that you've described, like now you describe, oh, I've got this thing. And somebody else is like, yeah, me too. And it's like, you're just not walking the path alone. Yes. Mm. And neither are they. Mm. And I heard somebody say once that people don't actually want to find someone to love them. They want the experience of being loving. Mm -hmm. And I think that plays into this, what you just said. It's not so much that I want to be validated and um, feel like my experience is okay. 
but it feels so meaningful to offer that to someone else, to be able to normalize, humanize, be compassionate about like, oh, honey, that this, this is it. You're doing it. You're, this is, you're okay. Let's just keep going. Um, to be that for someone else is really gratifying. And what I'm curious about there, this something that came up is, is there, oh gosh, <laughs> we could talk for a long time on this one. So it's it's not that I want to be loved as much as I want the experience of being loving. What's the correlation though back to being loved? Is it that by being loved, now I can be more loving? I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to oversimplify something that maybe doesn't need to be. But. I think I end up, uh, now I'm going to go back to authenticity. I feel myself as being who I really am, which is a kind of loving myself. Mm -hmm. Because I'm honoring my true nature, my spiritual nature, my my best self, whatever you want to call it. So back to that idea of the spiral, you know, when we in our communities start caring about each other like this, we feel good and we help others feel good. And it just keeps spreading out to the neighbors, the children, the people at the grocery store, you know. Yeah. Oh, so much there. Let me ask the fifth question. So Flame, what does getting off the comma look like for you? So my comma ended in one way organically, like I said, because my children both went to school. Eventually, I dropped them both off at elementary school and the door was opened. Now I had from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. to do something else with myself. Mm -hmm. But beyond that sort of time and structure limitation, it was for someone who had always felt excluded and shy. Now I had this set of people to engage with and to what can I do to help you? What can you do to help me? How can we make each other's lives better? And that fundamentally is what got me off the comma. Mm -hmm. That as well as the transformation of, um, of, I guess I'd call it like a point of mastery, that when we're in some of these really confusing situations that don't get resolved very easily, they're really calling us to our best selves. And I feel like I answered that call. So becoming my best self and engaging in my community by the time my kids went to school, it was like, okay, I think I have an idea of what to do now. You know, I need to go start going out to coffee and lunch with people and asking them if they'd like to take me on as their coach and get some business cards and get a part-time job so that we have some money coming in so I'm not so stressed about that all the time and take a nap before my kids get done with school because I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But really learning how to take care of myself and all of that. Yeah. So. So yeah. I'm hearing there's an element of time and and going ahead and letting it run its course, right? As you said, organically, yes. like whether you knew it or not, like there would come a time when there was going to be a circumstance that changed the whole dynamic. And for you, that was the kids finally starting school. And when you said this point of mastery, I'm also hearing like as odd as it can sound to somebody who's sitting on a comma getting really practiced at the being stuck part and leaning kind of into it, whatever that means to each person individually based on their own circumstance. Practice familiarity. Um, you know, maybe there's other words that come to mind for you, but there's, there's, a, there's a point where that becomes normal and not so sensational, and then it seems to be easier to kind of navigate. Yes, you're reminding me of Pema Chodron. I think she's the one who said, learn to be comfortable with the discomfort. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly what I was doing then. And that skill has kept me in good stead ever since. Well, and so much more we could unpack too, and so much more we could explore. But thank you for for sharing this story, and 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 uh, I really appreciated the layers because it's not just the story. Then there's the context around it. There's the what leads up to it. Um, as you look back at the the last you know conversation we've had, what would you acknowledge yourself for? I had a lot of fun with you. 
And I used to be someone who never had fun. Mm. So that's big for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I I too enjoyed this. I feel like I feel like you kind of accomplished the intention that you set out to uh, achieve. So now for kind of the the closing parts, there's two more sections here. So one is where can people find you? If somebody's interested to hear more, learn more, maybe they're interested in t- uh, taking you on as a coach or just contacting you to talk, where can people find you? And I'll put those links in the show notes. Awesome. Well, there's my Spark Sisters podcast page, uh, which is also available on all the big podcast avenues. Um, there's coachflame.com for my official coaching business. And uh, yeah. That's how you can find me. And then, Flame, one of the the last things that we do on the podcast that I feel like is an important important part of your story, as well as an important part of what we do with the podcast, which is giving voices to people, right? And so I always ask each guest, we call this acknowledgments, you know, who in your circles or in your world would you like to give a voice to, boost, promote, or just give a shout out to? Um, we call it acknowledgments, and, and that can be... You know, whether it's a cause or an organization or important people in your life, a mentor, um, other creators, who would you like to acknowledge? One person that comes to mind is a woman named Tosha Silver. She's a philosopher and um, an artist in her own right. And I didn't have her tools at the time that I was on the comma, but her specialty is surrender. And she does it in just the sweetest, most meaningful way. So I would shout out to Tosha. After my kids went to school, I started working a 12-step program because I was so freaking angry all the time. And there isn't like an angry anonymous, although maybe there should be. But Mm. a good friend of mine helped me discover Recovery is Anonymous, which is um, a 12-step for anyone who has any self-defeating behavior. Highly recommend it. Um, I will celebrate my my 10th sobriety anniversary next week, actually. Congratulations. So that's been an incredible tool. And uh, um, I want more people to know that it's there. Mm. And of course, I would shout out to my entire family and all of my incredible friends. Well, thank you for sharing that. As 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 with the contact information, we're going to put their references and their links um, where applicable in the show notes. And Flame, I, I've so appreciated you coming and sharing this story with us. There's elements of your story that really resonate with me and that I can definitely connect to. Um, and I know there's a lot of people out there who are definitely going to appreciate what you've shared. So you and I will continue to have more conversations beyond or outside off the mic. Um, but I'm just so grateful for you coming and, and sharing your experience with us today. Thank you for hosting and holding space for this incredible conversation to continue around the world day after day. Good work. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good rest of your week. What an honor it is for me to witness these powerful stories. I hope you feel the same way too. Think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. Surprises can reveal themselves to you when you do this. And if you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. Let's spread the word. Let's continue to build connection. And if you do discover something you'd like to unpack further, book a call with me and let's talk about it. My links are in the show notes. Be sure to like this episode, follow the podcast here on this platform and social media at Off The Comma. And feel free to comment and interact with these posts and episodes. Check out my website for workshops, events, and my sponsor community. I'm covering the costs of production by curating my own sponsors who align with our vision. Be sure to check them out. They're all powerful people and businesses. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off The Comma. As always, keep noticing and keep listening.